Kia ora and welcome to Chat Room. And today I'm talking with Anne Corney, who's the president of the Napier Repertory Players and the director of their mid-year production, Eugenia. And she has with her Jill Foster, who's the lead actor playing Eugenia, and one other role too. So let's talk about the show. Exciting, because this show has not been produced for a number of years since but, I think you just yeah. mentioned 2009 and Nelson was yes, the last correct. production. Yes. Yeah. So why did you choose this play? I, I read the published script um, written by Laura Parry in 2011 and fell in love with it and just sort of put it to one side and um, never let it really let it go and when the opportunity to direct this mid-year production I re-looked at it, it would have been last year and decided yes the time's right. So what was it about the script that you fell in love with? It's of course it's based on fact and I, and I, I, I really enjoy working with uh, a slice of life with a true story and being a drama that really also in, um, intrigued me. Yeah and, and this is an, a historical piece yes. as well from 1870s? Well, well, yes, I mean Eugenie was yeah. born in um, 1875 in Italy and then she immigrated in 1877 with her family and they moved to Newtown in Wellington. And she grew, grew up in Wellington. And the play itself is set of, um, between, between two time periods, 1916 yes. and 2016. Correct, yes. Yeah. And what is, what's the purpose of that? Why are there these two time periods in, in the play? Um, I, I should say first of all that the play is fictitious. So, but it is based, so based on, 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 on Eugenia's life here. Yeah. So in the 1916 time frame, it's all about Eugenia and her life and her marriage to, um, to Violet Donovan. And in the, the 2016, it's a play within a play. Uh, Jill also plays the role of Georgina Matheson, who is the deputy school principal. So that's the 2016 16, yes. And Violet Donovan um, is played by Monique Cowan and her role in the 2016 is Iris Robinson who comes to the school as the new drama teacher. As the school's centennial celebrations and Iris would like to direct a play or produce a play that has some historical um, relevance and she has chosen Eugenia. So the, in the two time frames are linked together um, in some of the scenes um, through dance and song and also dialogue. So the, the 2016 is the, is the two time frame, is the um, play within a play. Mm. So the 1916 aspect of this production and the storytelling is all about Eugenia's life and Eugenia mm -hmm. was a woman who chose to live as a man for most of yes, her, yeah. his life. Mm. Um, that exploration of gender and sexuality in that part of your production is also reflected a little bit in, in the 2016 setting, is that correct? Is there some kind of gender sexuality issue explored in the 2016 yeah. setting of the play within the play? It was the students who um, are rehearsing the play, that it, it, um, it touches them a wee bit um, and with, with Iris you know, opening up the, the, the topic um, to them um, and we've also discovered that maybe Iris and Georgina had a liaison. Jill would have her own backstory about that um, whether it was a full-blown affair or just um, not quite there but I mean and so we, we, we... So it's not it's not sort of clearly obvious from the script alone that that's what's happened but you're you're picking that up through your work as an actor reading into backstory or creating a backstory for your character. I think the part, the modern part of um, the play where the students are acting it out, yeah, that the message is there and that that is written into the play and the audience will easily be able to pick that. That, that there up. is a yes. lesbian relationship yes. going on or well, has possibly not, gone on. Yes, yes, possibly possibly gone on. Um, I certainly adhere to it when I when Iris arrives in, to our school and I meet her for the first time. I've met her previously. Um, and I'm a little uncomfortable about it because yes, we did have um, a, a very brief liaison over the course of a weekend conference and um, I was quite happy to leave it at that, but I think she may have felt differently. 
So. How hard is it for you as an actor to play two characters in two different time periods? It is it is quite difficult in this play, bearing in mind that um, the play is um, not written in, it's in two acts, but within those two acts there is a s sequence of very short scenes, some of them very short. So, and in act two, when there's a lot of action and business and physicality and a lot of the story is, is coming out, the changes are very, very quick and there's a lot of emotional stuff happening. So, um, yeah, I really have to stop and, and think where I am and what I'm doing. So, it's, um, it is quite difficult in places, but it's been challenging. It's it's fascinating. The the Georgina role, I, as I mentioned to you, I, I work in a school, so being sort of being part of the the education system, that role is is relatively easy and comfortable to to slip into. Um, Georgia, uh, Eugenia, of course, has been different. That's been that's been my challenge. But um, so, how have you gone about getting inside the skin of Eugenia and getting inside the skin of somebody who is? quite possibly what we would now call transgender? Um, really just by um, researching her and the information um, that we had about her, just reading the script and just over and over, before I, I even ex um, accepted the role, I had read the script numerous times um, and I was like Anne, I'm fascinated with the fact that it's um, a true story, well, based on a true story, to really the challenge of becoming this person and um, what it would be like to, yeah, to play a role like this. And it was helped by the fact that I knew in the way it is written, it's a very well written play, with being able to do the accent and that, that really helps. But yeah, having to become the um, transgender, um, is, is it's had its challenges, but it's it's uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yes. It's what really have some of the challenges been? Um, just to think all the time that you are a. Um, she was a really um, gutsy little man in a way, and was known to be like that, wiry, small, strong, energetic. Um, she the work she loved doing was real man's work working on the west coast with difficult horses working on a farm working in the brickworks um, in Nelson and then in Miramar and Wellington and uh, so just thinking about um, how I would act as somebody like that so the movement the walking even walking on stage as, as a man not as a woman um, Costuming, of course, makes a great difference once you get those men's clothes on. Yeah. That makes a difference. Yeah. But there's certain things that I have to do on stage that, that remind you that, yeah, you're a man, you know, chopping wood and various other things like great. that. Great. We're so. going to talk a little bit more about your character, Eugenia, because sure. that's really what this play is about, and it's the most interesting thing as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but we'll take a little break. We'll be back in a moment with Anne Corney and Jill Foster. Welcome back to chat room. We're speaking with the, um, oh, sorry I have to do that again. <laughs> Welcome back to chat room and I'm talking with Anne Corney from the Napier Repertory Players and her lead actor Jill Foster. So Jill we'd, we're just talking before the break about how you've sort of been able to climb inside this character as an actor and one of the things you, you'd mentioned was getting into costume and uh, I do remember from my days as an actor that putting on the shoes for me was always the thing. Mm -hmm. Once I had the shoes on, mm -hmm. then the walk yeah. came and the mm -hmm. physicality came and I started to sort of, you know, inhabit this person. What mm -hmm. are your shoes like? My <laughs> shoes are men's shoes, yeah, uh, for Eugenia. Oh um, yes, little business shoes. Absolutely. Um, Eugenia being Italian, although working a lot in the rural sector, um, was a, a fairly snappy little dresser from what we've, uh, we've uh, researched and understood. Um, yes, and you're absolutely right in just going from one role to the other. That is the change. I s take these off and slip on a pair of uh, high-heeled shoes for mm. uh, Georgina. So instantly, yes, and uh, a slight difference of jacket and what have you, and instantly it, that does help yeah. make it, yes. So you have all that you talked about these short scenes that you're chopping and changing between. They involve costume changes as well? As well, yes. On stage? Yeah. Uh, well, just in the wings, but very just off stage, because that's as far as we get. Never to a dressing room. I don't see the dressing room from the beginning of the play till the end. Um, 
for, for that reason. But because the, they're short scenes, um, they need to flow fairly seamlessly. So Anne has done a great job with keeping costume changes, particularly for myself and Violet, and also Iris, plays Iris, keeping that to an absolute minimum, just to give the hint, obviously, when we're in 2016, mm. and also the side of the stage, the stage and is a split stage. And to keep that sort of flow, yeah. not and break the rhythm Absolutely, of the, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So th that has helped, but of course, um, yeah, it's just lines and really thinking the character, getting inside Eugenia's head, what would she be thinking when she delivers this line or that line, what she's saying, what messages she conveying here, um, has helped me to yeah, become, yeah, become... So you gave me a little taste of Eugenia before we started recording. Mm -hmm. um, could we get a little bit of, of a taste of Eugenia speaking to me again about what... It, what it's been like yes, becoming certain, men. Yes, certainly. I did not feel like my sisters. I had the feelings of a boy. So every night I prayed to God that I would wake up a boy. I started to dress in my brother's clothes, and only my brother knew this. I would leave my father's house in the morning as dressed as a woman, and on the way changed to a man. I had a job on the west coast. But then my brother, he introduced me to his girlfriend. He introduced me as Jack. Only his girlfriend, she likes me. So my brother tells my father, and I am beaten and beaten, but I cannot be anything else. So I leave my father's house, and I continue to keep dressing as a man, mm. until finally I am a man. Wow. Mm. Great accent. Did you get some accent coaching? Yes, we did. Yes. So how did you go yes. about finding accent coaching for um, your actor? I can't remember how I got hold of uh, Pat Tom, uh, Tomby, who has been assisting us. And then she has a couple of uh, Italian friends who have just moved to Napier, Roberto and Roberta. So they've come along to rehearsal and it's been absolutely a delight listening to their oh. native language. And it'd be wonderful for them to yes. be drawn into a community yes. event so and, quickly. And, and Jill has had private lessons with them as well, or um, over cups of tea or coffee. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it, ha it has been wonderful. And so just that little taste of Eugenia mm. then, I got this feeling of the immense courage that this woman mm. had yeah. to Huge. live, in that yes. era, to live yes. so courageously as herself. Mm. When you think a hundred years ago, you know, and yeah. Well, we know now how much courage it would take. Yes, Imagine then absolutely. with the sort of stereotypes we had for oh, roles for women yeah, and roles yeah, for men. Absolutely. Yeah. So th those aspects of Eugenia as a character, obviously they've come to you from the play script, but where did Lorraine Parry get her information from? I understand there are at least two books written yes, about Eugenia. She, um, from the book written by Suzanne Faulkner, an Australian author. So. Um, Suzanne's book is called Eugenia, a Man, and it investigates her life and the, the trial that Eugenia um, had to go through, um, the, the criminal court case. Because eventually Eugenia went to Australia. Yes, she did. Mm. Yes. Her life in New Zealand became too limited and, yeah. and repressed, really, didn't it, as far yeah, as her yes. family went. There, was, mm. there were problems with her parents not... Coping she with. was designed. Yeah. She was designed, and so she w worked as a seaman and ended up in Australia. Yes. And there she married. Is that right? Well, uh, was uh, it there uh, she uh, yes, she did. But on on the way to Australia, the uh, the ship's captain was also Italian. So they struck up a friendship and and would have drinks in in his cabin at night time, speaking the native language. But one night, uh, Eugene, as she was, she adopted the name of Eugene Fellini. Eugene meant, spoke with a feminine version of a word. So slipped out of yes, the... Yes, and um, no Italian would have used the feminine version, it would have been a masculine version. And then the ship's captain became very suspicious, invited Eugene back to his cabin the next night, plastered him with more liquor and pulled his trousers down, discovered she, he was a female, raped her and she became pregnant. And so she was um, disembarked in Newcastle, uh, pregnant, alone, and destitute. Mm, must have been such a crisis mm -hmm. yes, at yeah. that point mm -hmm. in yeah. her life. Mm -hmm.
And she had, she had a baby girl named Josephine who she gave up for adoption and she left Josephine with an Italian lady who was present at the birth and um, that lady knew of Eugenia's yearning to live as a man and after li giving up Josephine for adoption she continued living as Harry Crawford and she lived as Harry Crawford for 22 years. And married. And married. And she, then there was yet another tragedy out yes, of that. Yes, yeah. Which she, yeah, she met and married Annie Burkett and after four years of marriage Annie um, learned of uh, Harry's true gender identity and then um, she disappeared. Her body was found three years later but within those three years Harry married again a second time to uh, Elizabeth Allison and but then in 1920 she was convicted or Harry was convicted of the murder of Annie Burkett. We will talk a little bit more yeah. about that sad mm. end to yeah. um, Eugene's life yeah. but we'll take another break first. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Chat Room, talking with Anne Corney and Jill Foster from the Napier Repertory Players. So we were just getting to the end of this very sad story about such a courageous person, um, where uh, Eugene, who'd become Harry, <laughs> um, is accused of the murder of his wife. Yes. And stands trial. Yes. Yeah. And, um, of course, the media had a frenzy. In 1920, this mm. woman dressing and living as a man and marrying, um, she was considered a freak. So that she was by, um, instantly um, had a, a biased trial. There were um, corrupt police investigations. There were two um, autopsies. One, when the unknown, um, unnamed body was found and there was no evidence of violence. Then there was a second autopsy when the body was exhumed and the pathologist changed the report after being um, persuaded by the police to do so that there, w there was evidence of violence. So what did they think had happened that, that Harry had physically attacked uh, uh, um, the wife? That I think um, with what I have researched is that the police um, decided that Harry had beaten Annie over the, with, with, uh, beaten her skull and then burned her. Um, but there was no, there's no real evidence mm. that that happened. And is there another story out there in the research? Well, that yes, Mark Tedeschi, who is the QC in Australia, and, and Suzanne Faulkner both agree, and I, I agree with them, that if you, um, Eugenia had been tried today, she would have been acquitted, or at the, at the very most, um, been um, convicted of manslaughter just purely because it was all circumstantial evidence. Not all of that tragedy is touched on in your, in your no, play though, no, right? No, it isn't. No. 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 So at what point of Eugene's life or Eugenia's life do we reach by the end of the play? We, re we reach, or during the course of the play, she marries the Violet, who is an, an Irish woman who she meets in the play. She meets her at a boarding house that she comes to in Wellington and um, yeah, they have a relationship and then it's um, Violet realises or it's revealed as she comes to find out that who her husband really is so um, the relationship starts to fall apart from that but there is Violet's death and it's yes it's made to look as if um, Eugenia is responsible for that death um, and as the character I obviously don't deal with that at all well because mm. for, for far as I'm concerned that's not what that is not what has, ha has happened at all so um, yeah so it just sort of ends really shortly after that with this to her trying to come to terms with the fact that her wife is now dead and she's been held responsible and being sent to so the play is a tragedy would you say 
Yes, Anne described it as a tragic love story, and I think that probably mm. is a good explanation yeah. of it. Yeah, it is very tragic in, in many ways, but it's very touching in many ways, and it's, as Anne said also, a few funny lines, but it is, yeah, it is quite a tragic, serious play, mm. um, and certainly looks at lots of issues, and obviously, yes, the transgender one is one, because on the other side of it, the school production um, runs along those lines too, because obviously you've got parents and a board who, um, are not quite so keen on what their students are getting up to in this production so it makes it very relevant and in today's world of course where there's been lots of transgender issues coming to the fore and the way of uh, toilets and schools for transgender students etc so it's still an issue it's, isn't yeah it? so it's, it's sort of very timely really that mm. we happen to be doing this yeah. play right now the play now. itself is actually 20 years old Mm, this year, yes, I think, isn't it? Yes. Because the first production was '96 at yes. Takirua in Wellington. Yeah. Yes. So it's sort of a, um, you could say, it's yeah. a bit of a celebration to yes. be producing it 20 years <laughs> since and still has relevance. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. very much so. It will, yeah, no, will there be schools coming to the production? Yeah, doing yes, some we have. Specifically, mm, for we schools? have offered it to a uh, special performance to schools, and Taradale High School have booked out the theatre for one of the performances, and other schools are coming on on, on another night. Do, they, do any of them study the script at all? Um, I'm not sure, but um, I know that the teachers are, are very um, um, excited about it. They've probably, like, like yourself, studied it uh, at university. Mm -hmm. And will Lorraine Perry be coming yes, to the show? Yes, yes she is. Mm -hmm. um, her and a partner and two, two guests are coming final night. Final mm -hmm. night. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. maybe there will be a birthday cake 20 years. Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it's interesting too that when it was done at, uh, in Wellington professionally, um, Lorraine herself was in the play. She played um, Eugenia's wife, the, the character of uh, a Violet. So, yeah. Right. And is there anything interesting or different about the way you've staged this play? You were talking about the venue capacity and that rather yeah. than the usual sort of 70, it's down to 50. Have you done something with the, yeah, with the stage? Yeah, I've, extend, I've extended the stage into the auditorium. So I have three um, performance areas. One, of course, for the, the present and then the other two, two sections are for the past. All on the same stage but uh, sort of differently aligned? or how? No, we have our main stage and then I've, I've had a stage built out into the auditorium. So we've taken up some of the seating space and, and, and that was a decision that the committee decided, yes, we can do because being a midwinter play, also being a little more topical, we may not get the audiences, but the inter I know the interest is out there. So let's experiment and, and, and use the auditorium as, as a stage or a performance area. And do you have, you talked about having uh, music and dance as yes. sort of transit transitional kind of yeah. um, we, there are, device. Yes, the, the, all, all the cast members have had to uh, learn to sing Bella Ciao in Italian. Jill has also had to learn to play the mandolin. Oh, that's a challenge. I remember <laughs> having to learn to play the guitar once for a show. How are just your fingers? <laughs> yeah, yes, it's, <laughs> it's just a very brief um, little piece that I yeah. that I have Still, to play. Thank goodness, yeah. but um, yes, that's probably one of the most terrifying parts of my role, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> albeit yeah. short, but um, I've had a very patient, lovely tutor. But um, oh yes, that's a scary bit. I have to say. How long yeah. have you both been involved with theatre in Hawke's Bay? Oh. Um, about th 30 years in Hawke's Bay, yes, mm. and probably... And um, I've been up here, I moved here from um, Wellington in the Hutt Valley. Um, I've done theatre since my, s and speech and drama since school days, but I've been here nearly 20 years, so in Hawke's Bay about 20 years. I hope yeah. that your season goes well for you. There oh. are 10 shows, is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. thank you. Yes. And opening on the 15th of June. Yes. Thanks heaps yeah. for coming in to talk to us about your work. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thanks for joining us on Chat Room. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.